Caller. Welcome to the show, my friend. Please tell everybody your name and where you're calling from. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Afroz. Uh, I'm calling from New Jersey, United States. And uh, Liam, I want to thank you f- for providing us this platform. Uh, thank you very much for your work. And Rabbi, assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Alaikum uh, salam. Rabbi, I'm grateful for, your, <laughs> grateful for your work and service. Enormous work. Uh, very much grateful. The question I have is this. Uh, I am currently taking a course in the Holocaust Studies, and um, one question came to my mind as I'm reading through the material and watching the videos. Did the church enlarge uh, ever express regret or ever ask for forgiveness for the indifference during the Holocaust or uh, collaboration in many cases uh, for, for the crime of uh, committing genocide towards the Jewish people. That's one. And uh, second question, as I understand uh, after listening to your uh, audio and video that the past 2000 years of anti-Semitism mostly was a result of the uh, Christian Bible, uh, what we find in Christian Bible. But now in today's world, is this anti-Semitism hidden, found in the found in the Christian Bible? Thank you, Afros. Uh, thanks for calling in, and we'll uh, just hang up and tune in for the answer, okay? Thank you, sir. Oh. Rabbi. Thank you very much. Oh, shalom, shalom. Gosh, I don't know where to begin. These are, these are very heavy questions. Um, let's begin with the first question. We talk about the church. It, it's right, immediately every listener who has even a superficial knowledge of Christendom uh, is right really wondering which denomination and which church. So I'm going to talk about the, for a moment, just briefly, about the church, the largest Christian denomination. The Roman Catholic Church was deeply influential and many of the highest ranking members of the uh, of the SS and the high officials um, of, of Nazi high officials were uh, members of the Roman Catholic Church as Adolf Hitler was baptized and confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church and, and moreover I know this makes Christians uh, very upset and they go Hitler wasn't a Christian I could tell you this, I've read Mein Kampf a few times, and I, I presumably, I know that the copyright is over, so it has to be available online. And I, I strongly encourage anyone who really is serious about this question to, um, to just find Mein Kampf, it's free online today, and just do a search. And do a search of the word Jesus. Just do that. Just. I, just go to, I have Mein Kampf, I have the book translated into English, and I just went to the index, I looked up Jesus Christ, and then I looked it up, and there is nothing, not only nothing negative, but quite a few positive statements that are said about Jesus. But I don't want to talk about Hitler, because I don't know how, to the extent of his religiosity, but he certainly wasn't not only wasn't he, but during the twelve years that he was, that he he he, he led Germany, um, uh, every church uh, throughout Germany, uh, throughout the Einschluss, in fact, uh, um, celebrated Hitler's birthday every August twentieth, every April twentieth. Uh, and in fact, according to Paul Johnson, Paul Johnson is one of, well, one of my favorite uh, contemporary historians. It should be noted, incidentally, that Paul Johnson is a Roman Catholic. Uh, He concedes that roughly 55% of the Waffen-SS were members of the Roman Catholic Church in good standing. And as it turns out, the only member of the Roman Catholic Church that was that was a high official in uh, in the Third Reich that was excommunicated as it turns out was Goebbels 
and Goebbels was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, not for his unspeakable crimes against the children of Israel, not for unimaginable propaganda and literally being Hitler's right-hand man, but the reason he was ex excommunicated was because he married a Protestant, uh, Ma uh, Magla. Therefore, that's that's what got him expelled. Uh, in fact, the although the Roman Catholic Church to this day, until let's say uh, until the early 1990s, didn't have diplomatic relations with this Jewish state, it sure did have forge uh, diplomatic relations immediately with Nazi Germany. That it, it didn't have no problem with that. And the, and the SS had a belt buckle that read prominently, Gott mit uns, which means that God is with us. Um, moreover, the, the um, uh, following the Holocaust and following the defeat of Nazi Germany, we know this. This is not any uh, conspiracy or anything like that. The, the Roman Catholic Church had an official office set aside specifically for the purpose of assisting and aiding Nazis who had to flee justice from either the Allies or from the Russians, and they successfully assisted uh, many Nazis, giving them new, providing for them new identities, for them to flee to South America. It's painful reading, but those of you who uh, wish to study this topic, uh, there is a book uh, called Hitler's Pope, and I will tell you, it will blow your mind away. Now, that's the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church also engaged in an enormous amount of denial and claimed that somehow Pius XII, ugh, what a name, Pius XII. Uh, you should know that if you look at the popes with the name Pius, watch out. Pius XII um, was silent during the Holocaust. He could have likely saved many, many Jews. And instead, when the Gestapo came into Rome, he stood by silently. And um, and the Roman Catholic Church to this day is still in denial of the complicity of Rome in the destruction of world Jewry. Um, the Lutheran Church... You know, what's interesting about the Lutheran Church is they have... They, they did you know, a, a, an apology many, many years later and regret and so on and so forth. But, you know, it, it doesn't, it, as it turns out, the Lutheran Church, particularly the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and the, they're not evangelicals in a conventional sense, but that's their name, are still some of the most hideous opponents of the Jewish people to this day. And... Uh, cause an enormous amount of problems for our nation. It should be said that the Holocaust could not have happened without Christianity. It would be, it would not be possible. It is not an accident that the Shoah uh, only occurred in Christian countries. There may be some Christians watching this that are going, well, the Christians that participated in this were not real Christians. Well, it turns out there were, there were all sorts of Christians, but the one thing that's for sure, that's certain is that if Jews made their way to countries like in the Far East, uh, to Shanghai, if they made their way, got to Japan, 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 these are the allies of the Nazis. Japan was the most prominent member of the Axis. You were safe. A Jew was safe in, J in Japan because Japan is not, was not a Christian country. It has its own r religious beliefs and emperor worship. But whatever it was, anti-Semitism is literally unknown in that part of the world, because they just weren't poisoned with the with the teachings of not just the Christian Bible, but of all the church fathers, 
And I just say this to you when, when you know, if, if you're a Christian and you're watching this and you're offended, I don't know what to say to you. But if you just Google, you know, anti-Semitism in church fathers, and you will not believe that the, the very people that you admire, look up to, study, if you're a Catholic, venerate, it doesn't make any difference. It was Uranus, the uh, French, uh, the Bishop of Lyon, there was no France then, but um, if it was Augustine, the Bishop of what is today Algeria, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. They all, they all hated Jews. Tertullian despised Jews. They all had the most vulgar, I mean, this was not you know, this is not like Keith Ellison, who was, uh, who wanted to head the DNC, and he didn't quite, he didn't quite make it. But you know, who, you know, this is not Farrakhan anti-Semitism, where you know Farrakhan called Judaism a gutter religion. These are people who just call for the destruction of Jews. I mean, talk about Melito. I mean, we have his letters about the Jews. This is very early. They all hated Jews. It, it's not an accident that Jules Streicher was given Luther's work. Most famous about the Jews is one published three years before he died in 1543 uh, called The Jews and Their Lies. And I've read it many, many times. I quote it in my books. It is... If you read that, look, you don't have to do this because it really is very upsetting. But if you want to know, if you, if you want to know and you don't want to get the propaganda, you read Luther's works and you read Mein Kampf. And I ask any reasonable person, is the writings of Adolf Hitler more anti-Semitic than Luther? If you say that they are, then you just haven't read it. It's not about Luther, but Luther's colleague, Busser. It's not just Busser, but it's also... They all hated Jews. And what's very interesting about the Jew hatred of the church was that it it, it seemed to... It's like, it was like the, the anti-Semitism that moved, that metastasized from Christian Tsarist Russia to communist Russia. That even though after the following the revolution and with the birth of the Soviet Union, the country essentially became a godless country. It certainly had jettisoned uh, uh, religion or belief in Jesus or any of those things. It was an atheist state. But the anti-Semitism remained, and it was identical. It's the same caricatures and all of it were... were, were it, it's something so pernicious that it can't be jettisoned. The, the only people who really sincerely apologize are, are folks to, like uh, John Hagee, uh, people like that genuinely feel terrible. I think um, more liberal Christians in the United States feel awful. And there was, in a sense, a, a rethinking uh, it's something called post-Auschwitz theology. I'm going to just briefly state what this means. It's a sort of a pedestrian term, but it, it means that the church sort of rethought its approach to how Christianity was 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 conveyed, Jesus more specifically, and that the church kind of felt that maybe the Jewish context of of Christianity had been stripped. And that's what made the Holocaust possible. But there was no substantive change, except among those who adopted a, uh, the premillennial dispensationalism of John Nelson Darby, a 19th century uh, British uh, evangelist who came to the United States, who preached that the Jews were not rejected by God, and the covenant made with the Jewish people was was not uh, uh, abrogated and then replaced by the church, but the covenant with the Jews continues. So those who embrace that theology, who embrace the teachings that uh, uh, Cyrus Schofield uh, advanced in his very popular Schofield, so that group 
uh, where there was a genuine philo-Semitism. So that group, of course, felt awful about it and expressed it. But the Roman Catholic Church, there were, there was a, a following Pius XII, there was who's a man who is called the Papa Bueno, the, the good Pope, Pope John the Twenty Third, who one could argue did not hold the hostile feelings that prior bishops of Rome held. He did convene the Second Vatican Council and in a, a very brief document called In Our Time, it, it essentially seeks to advance the idea that the Jews are not uh, of today are not responsible for killing Jesus and the odious liturgy of uh, that is found in the Good Friday uh, the, that Catholics said on Good Friday, referring to the Jews as perfidious, should be removed and so on. He didn't live long enough for the Vat Second Vatican Council to um, to be completed. He died before its end, but uh, the outcome was definitely for the better. And um, but still, the the Roman Catholic Church, you know, has always been the absolute enemy of the Jewish people. The Nazis were all uh, Christians and. You know, whether they were Lutherans, it, you know, it depends, but they were Lutherans and Roman Catholics for the most part. But what is more interesting is why is there such an, so much anti-Jewish rhetoric in the Christian Bible? I, I don't mean statements like... Um, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets and are contrary to all mankind. You know, all that really nasty stuff where the Jews are the seed of the devil in John chapter 8, verse 44. That's not how the Christian Bible um, colors the Jewish people in the darkest, in the darkest shade possible. Because remember, Europeans, Christians, are not genetically, were not genetically bad. They were just reading literature, meaning the Christian Bible, that it, 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 unless, if, you, if, you, if you're growing up as some, you know, pre-millennial dispensationalist, you're going to have to re, uh, reverse engineer these statements. And they do. That means those who are pro-Jewish, who are Christians, which was very popular in the U.S. among evangelicals. It's a, it's a very large segment, probably 70 million evangelicals that identify this way. But if you read it, a natural reading of the text is overtly anti-Jewish. The Jews are held in contempt where the Jews are portrayed as completely culpable for Jesus' uh, crucifixion. Uh, and and most importantly, the further, the later the book, or the later the gospel, the more anti-Jewish it is. And this is very clear. So if you look at Mark's passion narrative as an example, and roughly a th one third of the book of Mark is a passion narrative. It's often been said that the book of Mark is basically one big passion narrative with a long introduction. Uh, so uh, the Jews are jostling or pushing or pressuring Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus. And Pontius Pilate goes along with it. And it, it certainly portrays the Jews as culpable for the responsibility uh, of Jesus' crucifixion. But as you move to Matthew and Luke, which are written some 15 years after Mark, uh, the the two things happen simultaneously, and that is that the responsibility, the culpability of the Jews for killing Jesus, uh, is increased, and the and the Romans are further exonerated. Um, you'll find this in Matthew, very very pronounced. It's the only book in the Christian Bible where we're introduced to Pontius Pilate and his wife. It's the only place you'll find Pontius Pilate's wife. And, and here you have hordes of Jews screaming 
for Jesus to be executed and Pontius Pilate saying that the, I see this man is innocent and symbolically washing his hands of this event because he's squarely on the side of Jesus and opposing the hordes of Jews who are demanding Jesus' crucifixion. And it does, if you look at the text, it, it doesn't make sense. It, it's just, it's, ir, it's, it's it, and the Jews scream, we take this upon ourselves and our children. A single passage that is without a question responsible for the death of more Jews than any other passage in the Christian Bible. And in, in Matthew, Pontius Pilate's wife, who was then present, had a dream the previous evening where she, she has a dream that Jesus is innocent of any charges. So imagine the scene that's painted in Matthew. The scene there is you have Pontius Pilate and his wife, the two Gentiles, defending Jesus, saying he's innocent, Jesus shouldn't be crucified, and the hordes of Jews who are demanding Jesus' um, crucifixion and saying that we accept his the, his death not only upon our, the the responsibility of his death not only upon ourselves but upon our children. That means that all future generations are responsible for the death of Jesus and are are Christ killers. It, now, once we get to the book of John, it gets insane because in John, Pont, we we have a conversation this this discourse. John is very different than the synoptics, just in every way. But one of them is in the literary sense. There's these very long dialogues in the book of John that you don't really find in synoptic gospels. And one of them is a dialogue between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, where Jesus says to Pontius Pilate just squarely in the eye that you're not responsible for what is, what's unfolding here, and therefore those who gave me over to you, their sin is greater. Pontius Pilate is completely exonerated. In fact, after the Jews demand Jesus' crucifixion, it literally, if you look at the text, it literally says that Pilate gave Jesus over to them, and the them there is the Jews. What you have is, if you look at the trajectory of the New Testament, is that the later the book, you can map this real easy, the, the, the later the book is written, the greater the culpability is for the Jew, for the Jewish people, and the and the responsibility uh, for the Roman the Roman responsibility for Jesus' execution uh, evaporates recedes completely. Now, if you if we went and I'm not going to do it now, if we went to texts to gospels that didn't make it into the canon, it gets crazy. It, it means if we continue this, in case you think there's a coincidence, if you go to the Gospel of Peter written a little bit later. In the second century, forget it. I mean, that's insane. Uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, also overtly anti-Jewish. And, and it's one point should be made. It's not just saying the Jews are bad or the seed of the devil and so on. It's the storytelling in the Gospels that affect the reader to the extent that Christians would believe anything about the Jews, that the Jews would... Um, would would kill Christian boys and drink their blood, even though it, Judaism is the only religion where drinking blood is absolutely forbidden. Well, it's in, it's forbidden in Islam as well. But it, this is so. Uh, it, it, you know, in one sense, we'll say, well, Christians are really bad. I say this that it, Christians are um, uh, uh, were completely rational. They were looking at literature and reading it literally and drawing the only possible conclusion. And that conclusion was the Jews are absolute Christ killers. And in case you think that maybe this is an opinion of a rabbi who is not fond of the Christian religion, and therefore I'm saying this in order to somehow cast Christian... If, if, you, if you feel that way, you, you, please pick your reformer Pick your church father and just read what they wrote about the Jews. L look at John, the golden tongue John, to see what he had to say about the Jews. And, and you will look what Tertullian wrote about the Jews. Um, look what Jerome wrote about the Jews. And, and you could disown one. They got like, you'll, go, you'll lose your mind. What you realize is, is that uh, 
uh, Christians in Europe were completely rational. And if the Germans had said that the that our unglick, our misfortune, and those who are trying to destroy who are the parasites of society, of civilization, were not the Jews, but rather they were the Irish, no one would have believed it. And the Holocaust would have never happened. If Hitler would have blamed the Irish, people would go, are you insane? Because it, didn't make, it wouldn't have made sense. Hitler was a, a, a very skilled orator, but he could not have uh, galvanized he could not possibly have galvanized uh, Europe against the Jews without, uh, without, without Christianity to make that possible. It was all, all the caricatures of Jews. Now, the question, of course, is, is the screaming question here is, why? And sometimes I'm asked the question, well, wasn't, the New Testament wasn't it written by Jews? Why would Jews write these things? terrible things about about the Jews. So, as it turns out, I, this point needs to be made, is that we really don't know who wrote the Gospels. And in fact, I should have said really, because really somehow maybe mitigates against us. I want to take out, I want to restate that. We don't know who wrote the Christian Bible, we need the Gospels. In fact, the, the only of the of the 27 books in the Christian Bible, we really only know who wrote eight of the books. We know that seven uh, books of Paul, the inscriptions are correct. Uh, the other six are highly doubtful. And the book of Revelation was written by someone named John. So we don't know who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I know it says St. Matthew in the Christian Bible, but that's not in the manuscripts. That's a later Christian inscription. Second century scribes uh, were responsible for saying that these texts are... Uh, this was written by, uh, Matthew was written by a disciple, a tax collector. Uh, John, the book of John was known as the book of John. Even though John, whoever wrote it, explicitly states in John twenty one twenty that he is not John because he got his information from the disciple who Jesus loved, which would have been John, the son of Zebedee. It doesn't make a difference. That's what they're told, and they think. Uh, so the question is, so we don't know it was that whoever that who wrote the Gospels. We we know a few things about them. Uh, we know what sources they had in front of them. We know that they were highly literate Christians who lived toward the end of the first century. Uh, but we don't know what their religion is. But the key question is why were the Jews portrayed this way, and why were the Romans largely exonerated to such an extent that to this day. In the Ethiopian church, you won't even believe this. You'll have to look it up for yourself. In the Ethiopian church, Pontius Pilate, the person, I mean, this was the, the man who was in authority during this time, responsible for Jesus' crucifixion, and he remained in authority until 37. Pontius Pilate was regarded as a saint, and according to their tradition, Pontius Pilate felt so much regret over having Jesus crucified, they actually committed suicide. So he's venerated as a saint. I mean, I know you're going, really? Yes, really. I'm not making any of this stuff up. So let's finally turn, go to the final part of this, and that is why. Why is there, is the, is the responsibility of the, of the Roman responsibility for Jesus' crucifixion uh, not there, and the Jews are blamed. And it says so, but I can go to the beginning of Acts, speech of Peter. It doesn't make a difference. all over the place. It's everywhere. And if you don't see it, then you're not reading it, or you're, you are a Christian Zionist, and to you it's inconceivable that your New Testament is anti-Semitic because you love Jews, and therefore you have to, re, you have to re-examine the text. But you... Please read all the church fathers, read all the reformers, read Spurgeon's speeches about the Jews, and they all say what I'm saying. This is very important. This is not my opinion in order to color uh, Christianity or Christians in a, in, in, a, in a way. This is my take is exactly the take of almost all Christians. Okay? So the question is why? Why are the Jews portrayed this way? 
and, and, and the stories of what the Jews were doing, that means during Jesus' life, during his ministry, during his healings that, we are, that are described in the Gospels, the Jews are like trying to stop Jesus from healing people. And it doesn't even make sense. Why? What would you? What prohibition was he be violating by healing someone's Shabbos? The stories have been concocted in order to portray why. And the answer is very simple. This is an Occam's razor issue, which means the simplest answer is the correct one. Here is very simple, and that is you have to. The church had to explain from its inception. From the get-go, it had to explain why the Jews largely did not believe in the tense of Christianity, why did Judaism reject these teachings, and why did Christians, why did, why did, why did, gen, did Gentiles uh, accept it? Why were the Jews so unimpressed with the Christian message? This is very critical, and the answer had to be was that the Jews were demonic, that the Jews were really enemies of God. Because this is a very serious question. The very serious question is, why the, who was living in the land of Israel during the first century? Jews. Who would, would have encountered Jesus? The Christian Jews who spoke the language of Jesus, J- Jews. Jesus emerged from a Jewish crucible. Why didn't the Jews believe in Jesus? When I speak to pastors, they tell me that the question they're asked most frequently is, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? I, I just spoke in Manila two weeks ago for, for the most prestigious Christian university in the Philippines where quite a number of the presidents of the Philippines gradu- from which graduated. And I, I was speaking about the Torah and Mount Sinai. And by the way, the people of the Philippines have a very deep affection for the Jewish people. Why is... But they're very, very unique, very different. It's Southeast Asia for whatever reason. But as it turned out, the very first question the students asked me, my lecture was not about Christianity or Jesus, was... Why don't Jews believe in Jesus? This plagues Christians. They just don't get it. So the, there are two ways that Christians could explain this phenomenon. They can either say that the Jews are reading the Jew, this scripture and have drawn a completely different conclusion. That's one possible, which is true. That means the real answer that a pastor should be responding to the age-old question, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? The real true answer is Jews are examining, encountering the Christian claim uh, that Jesus died for the sins of mankind and rose from the dead and he was the second person of a triune Godhead. Jews are reading their texts and are saying that that this, these are rather fantastic claims. They're drawing a totally different conclusion. And based on their reading of the Jewish Bible, they're concluding that the Christian claims are, are I'm going to use a strong word, are, are bogus. And that's how Jews feel, Jews feel about this. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity and so on, these things, are not just bogus, that's too weak, but in fact are opposed by the teachings of the Jewish scriptures. So Jews are drawing a different conclusion. Okay? Now they could say that, the problem is, every thinking person is going to go, the Jews, that means they're the only ones, basically, who can read the Jewish scriptures in the original Hebrew. The Jews are the ones who encountered Jesus in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. They were there. We weren't there. Whether we're from Africa or we're from, you know, from Europe, we were, my grandparents weren't there, but the grandparents of Jews were there. And they virtually all, with the exception of very few, were said that he's not the Messiah. So this is a major problem. And the whole idea of a Messiah is Jewish. So this creates a, an enormous credibility problem. And therefore the church had to shape, portray the Jews as, um, as demonic enemies of, of God and enemies of God's salvation plan for mankind. And therefore one could say that the Jews were enemies of God, demonic. If they wanted to be a little nicer, they can say the Jews had scales over their eyes, there were veils over... This is all complete nonsense. The Jews are just reading the Jewish Bible, and then we're examining Christian claims, we're going, there's no relationship between what the church teaches about Jesus and what the Jewish Bible, what Isaiah and Ezekiel teach about the Messiah. 
So that's the reason why the New Testament has to say the Jews are just bad. They're bad people. Oh, they're bad people. Of course they're enemies of God. So there's, there's the answer. The answer is the church had to frame the Jews as, as mindless, as very, very important, mindless enemies of God, a banal nation that was dedicated to undermining God's plan of grace. Who would do that? Only the most devilish people, namely the Jews. And this is how the Jews were portrayed as people of the devil. It's, it's just one other point. The text of the New Testament even goes further. It's in the New Testament, if you read it, and I'll, I'll just do this very quickly. The text in the Christian Bible portray the Jews just as not only as deliberately unbelieving, but in fact, the the, the New Testament is very clear that the Jews really knew that Jesus is the Messiah, but rejected him anyway. And I get this accusation all the time from Christians. And this is an outrageous claim. That means the Jews deep down think that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, as were the priests who find out from the Roman soldiers in Matthew guarding Jesus' tomb. But they just pay them off. Why don't they just say, oh, I guess he did resurrect. We were mistaken. No. These are a demonic people. And then... With that kind of explanation, people say, oh, the Jews are the devil. And if the Jews are the devil, then we can destroy them. Because one point is important when it comes to uh, racism of any kind. In order for a people to commit genocide against another, in order for a people to hate another nation to the point of wanting to kill them, they have to be dehumanized. They can't be like others. They can't be like others. It's not just you don't like their music and culture, but these are the people of the devil. They have to be. And that's how the Germans, in fact, spoke of the Jews, which resonated for Christians. And that is, Jews are untermenschen, which means they are subhuman. They are are unglick. They are parasitical people. They are people of the devil. They have horns. So that's where this comes from, and that's why the Christian Bible framed it this way. And therefore, I'm saying that Luther wasn't a bad guy. Luther was an honest guy. He was reading the text honestly, and he was drawing the only logical conclusion he could. <laughs> יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה 